Chapter 375 Gathering Venue It's finally here. Oh. Lumion exhaled, folded the letter, and left Alberge to Cocteray. He didn't need to look for Franca. They had discussed the gathering many times before, so there was no need to waste time confirming it. Lumion made his way to the new safe house on Rue de Rosignol and tossed the satchel containing the flog boxing gloves onto the bed. He hadn't prepared an additional iron cabinet with a few traps hidden in the room. Regular thieves couldn't approach the core area. Forcing their way in would only cost them their lives. An iron cabinet wouldn't stop exceptional thieves anyway. When the time was right, Lumion donned a hooded black robe that bore a striking resemblance to the attire worn by warlocks. All according to Madame Gila and Franco's descriptions of his sister's appearance at these gatherings. Then, he pulled out Lai and transformed it into a simple yet exquisite silver-white earring. He secured it onto his right earlobe. Gazing into the full-length mirror, Lumion maintained a calm demeanor as he observed a sudden transformation of him growing shorter. His hair morphed into a luxuriant shade of pure gold, growing thick and cascading down his back. His facial features underwent a metamorphosis, mirroring those etched in his memories of Aurore. His nose bridge, now elevated and delicate, complemented his lips, neither too full nor too thin. Painted in a subtle shade of red, his eyes, light blue and clear, emitted a faint but captivating luminescence. In the past, Lumion had always perceived his sister as a paradox, her inner self contrasting sharply with her outward appearance. She exuded an aura of sunshine, cheerfulness, and open-mindedness, yet in reality, she was a homebody, reluctant to venture out for social interactions. Only those who had truly earned her trust were privileged to witness her relaxed demeanor, the quirky phrases she often uttered, and her playful and bullying side. On the contrary, Aurore displayed no apprehension when stepping out into the world. Much like Lumion, she possessed the natural ability to connect with the elderly ladies of Cordu and regaled the children with captivating stories, earning their affection. Ever since Lumion had learned about his sister's true background, he had come to comprehend the stark divergence between Aurore's inner self and her external appearance and demeanor. Certainly, many people grappled with such contradictions, but Aurore's unique circumstances had magnified this incongruity. Lately, Lumion often found himself pondering what his sister had been like and the kind of life she had led. As he stared into the mirror, Aurore's light blue eyes seemed to take on a misty quality, as if she too were lost in reminiscences of days gone by. Lumion still held vivid memories of the first time his sister had mentioned her homeland. It happened during his second year in Kordu. Back then, when the shepherds had returned to the highland pastures, Aurore had taken him to pat the newly born lambs and, cruelly, bought their loved ones. They ventured into the green pastures adorned with white and yellow wildflowers, carefully selecting a spot that wouldn't disturb the serene surroundings. They then set up a charcoal grill for a picnic. As night descended upon them, and the starry heavens unveiled themselves like a boundless river of glistening diamonds, Aurore suddenly drifted into a reverie, her fingers brushing away tears. Lumion inquired about her thoughts, and she confessed to a profound sense of homesickness. Aurore's gaze in the mirror seemed to lose focus, mirroring the soft, yellowish-blue glow of the cardboard lamp. The mountain village nestled beside those vibrant green pastures under the radiant sun, it was a place they could never return to. After a while, Lumion opened the pocket watch he had borrowed from Sal de Babres, confirming the time. Then, he donned a sleek silver-white half-mask, revealing his finely sculpted lips and chiseled chin to the world. Without delay, Lumion retrieved a piece of paper adorned with the ancient Faisak script and affixed it securely to his left breast, displaying the word Muggle. As Franca had explained, the Curly Hair Baboons Research Society boasted a sizable membership, each member donning unique disguises during their gatherings. Without the corresponding code names, distinguishing one from another would be an insurmountable task, save for those closely acquainted with each other. Despite hailing from the same world, the society's members hailed from diverse homelands, each with their distinct languages. Upon their transmigration to this world, they found themselves scattered across different countries inevitably erecting language barriers. Initially, they relied on the linguistic prowess of fellow members who were polyglots. However, over time, 
they gravitated towards adopting ancient Faisak, the common tongue of the northern continent, as their shared language. For curly hair baboons research society members residing in different nations, ancient Faisak bore striking similarities to their mother tongues, easing their acquisition and mastery. Naturally, there were exceptions among the society's ranks, those whose native languages diverged significantly from ancient Faisak, but they were a minority. They had to follow the majority, knowing that, until they mastered the language, someone would always be there to translate for them. Lumian had already laid a strong foundation in ancient Faisak. Ever since his arrival in Treyar, he had diligently immersed himself in Aurora's grimoires, plunging deeper into this linguistic realm. Basic communication posed no challenge for him any longer. Approaching 10 p.m., Lumian made final adjustments to his appearance in front of the full-length mirror, ensuring everything was in its rightful place. He concealed an assortment of ritual components and the alcohol flask containing the decency brooch within the concealed pocket of his warlock-like black robe. With Madame Hila's letter clutched firmly in his hand, Lumian began the recitation for the Hermes gathering. It be honor from ancient times, ruler of the nation of the Evernight, noble mother of the sky, I beseech your permission to enter your kingdom. As the words escaped Lumian's lips, the world around him underwent a sudden and eerie transformation. He beheld his own reflection in the mirror, like a pencil sketch hastily erased by an eraser. His vision dimmed, plunging him into what felt like the deepest of slumbers. Abruptly, Lumian's consciousness drifted to the gathering, the pounding of his heart resonating within his ears. He snapped out of his reverie, finding himself within a palace marked by crumbling stone walls and encroaching weeds. In its heart lay a massive weathered stone throne, yet no one ventured near it. Through the fissures in the walls and the time-worn windows, Lumian glimpsed a night shrouded in darkness and cold, veiled by a thick fog. Faint starlight penetrated the fog, casting a feeble glow upon the palace and the dreamlike town enshrouded by the fog. The town appeared utterly deserted, as if plucked from a dream. Within the palace, stone candlesticks embedded in the walls flickered, bathing the surroundings in their warm, yellow flames. At that precise moment, over a hundred figures arrived, each attired in distinctive garments. Lumian scanned the assembly, but could not yet spot Madame Hila. However, he recognized Hidden Blade Franca. Clad in her favored assassin's garb, black robes complemented by leather armor, a hood drawn low, and a silver half-mask gracing her countenance. Franca engaged in conversation with a group of similarly attired individuals. Yet, among them, Franca stood as the sole genuine assassin. Lumian didn't greet Franca. Following her instructions and the hints in Madame Hila's letter, he approached the huge stone chair. Such a crowded gathering was no different from a marketplace. It was unlikely to form a unified communication and transaction. The gathering naturally fragmented into smaller groups. Only when there was a matter of particular significance would President Gandalf or Vice Presidents like Hila take their place by the massive stone chair to address the assembly. Of course, someone could do the same if they wanted to share their intentions with the entire gathering. Aurora had been a regular attendee at the Academy's gatherings. Their designated meeting spot nestled deep within the palace, tucked away to the left of the huge stone throne. As Lumian advanced in that direction, he couldn't help but marvel at the mystical nature of the gathering. After reciting the incantation, he had departed from the Rue de Rosignol safe house in the market district, only to find himself transported to this mysterious and ancient palace. The members of the Curly Hair Baboons Research Society hailed from diverse corners of the northern and southern continents, yet they had all managed to converge here within a specific time frame. Lumian had never encountered such a mystical power before, surpassing even teleportation. Only the bestowed sowers of the Great Mother could compare. What baffled him, however, was Franco's never sharing the method of entering the gathering. Even if they were face to face, he wouldn't hear it unless granted permission by Madame Hila. But it was just reciting an incantation, wasn't it? How could he not hear it? As Franca had explained, this power likely stemmed from a sealed artifact, an artifact Madame Hila couldn't fully control but could employ to a certain extent. Beyond this method of convening, the curly-haired baboons research society possessed other means, although these were established by various groups for internal or clique gatherings. For instance, Hidden Blade Franca had set up a telegram group with select members, 
utilizing a miniaturized and simplified analyzer for scheduled chats. Recalling Franca and Hela's rough descriptions of Aurora during the gatherings and forming his own assumptions, Lumian's steps grew lighter. He believed that, given the unique and shared origin of the curly hair baboon's research society members, even if his sister wished to remain guarded amidst the assembly, her relaxed demeanor, akin to his interactions with her, would prevail, possibly even more prominently so. This was a state devoid of profound secrets. Additional figures began to manifest, their forms rapidly taking shape in the air, akin to oil paintings successfully duplicated. Among the members of the curly hair baboon's research society, a diverse and eclectic array of disguises flourished. Some were clad in traditional iron-gray full-body armor, while others embraced vibrant red, yellow, white, and multicolored paint, transforming into clowns. A handful sported extravagant makeup veiling their true visages, resembling wicked witches from ancient folklore. Still, others adorned themselves with monstrous helmets, sculpted from orange-yellow pumpkins, or relied on makeshift hoods to become pale vampires with strikingly red lips. Some even chose horse-like attires that enveloped them from head to toe. It was a spectacle more fantastical and imaginative than the masquerade balls documented in newspapers and magazines. As Lumian strolled amidst the curly hair baboon's research society's diverse members, a faint smile played on his lips. Occasionally, he would nod in acknowledgement of those who greeted him. At last, he reached the corner housing the academy team. His eyes naturally swept over the code names displayed on their attires. Pettigrew, Professor, Griffin, Eagle, Bear, Headmaster, Periodic Table, Isotope.